This is going to be an overview of the book of 1 Samuel. This book has 31 chapters, 810 verses, and 25,061 words. And this book of 1 Samuel is a tr transition book that goes from the time of the judges to a time of kings and prophets. And this book is one of the six books in the Old Testament that deals with kings and kingdoms. There are three main characters in the book of 1 Samuel. And those three characters are Samuel, Saul, and David. We will also look at characters like Jonathan. But in chapters 1 through 3, you see a character by the name of Eli. He is a priest judge. But when Samuel steps in on the scene as prophet judge, you have him as the last judge. And then in Acts 13.20... It says, And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until the time, or until Samuel the prophet. So, prophet judge Samuel, you'll see him through chapters 1 through 8. And the name Samuel means asked of God. He was a man of prayer. In 1 Samuel 9 9, it says, Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So Samuel, a prophet, was called a seer. And Israel's sin in this book is that they wanted a king instead of having God as king in their hearts. So the Lord gives them what they want, and many times what we want isn't what we need. And... I think the main verses in this book is in 1 Samuel 8, 19 through 22, where it talks about this very subject. And it says, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man into his city. So that is the idea behind 1 Samuel. You have Samuel the seer, and you have Saul anointed as king. When God didn't want the people to have a king, he wanted to rule in their hearts as king. So in chapters 9 through 15, you have Saul coming to the picture in first samuel 9 2 it says and he had a son whose name was saul a choice young man and a goodly and there was not among the children of israel a goodlier person than he from his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people so saul starts out good and ends up bad the opposite of saul in the new testament who starts out bad and ends up a good man, the Apostle Paul. So there's two Sauls. One starts out bad. or In the Old Testament, one starts out good, ends up bad. In the New Testament, one starts out bad and ends up good and turns into the Apostle Paul. But then in chapters 16 through 31, you have King David. And David is the one that God wants, while Saul is the people's choice. But because man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart, as it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, but the people saw how big and warrior-like Saul looked, while David, you know, he was not much to look at. In 1 Corinthians one twenty eight, it says, And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to not things that are. So the Lord looks on the heart. David, as a type of Christ, is anointed king, and Saul, the type of the Antichrist, opposes him. So although Saul is David's enemy, the son of Saul, Jonathan, becomes best friends with David. So with this brief description, let's go through some of the chapters of this book. And in chapter 1, you need to read about this great woman named Hannah, who was way more of a prayer warrior than the people on that War Room movie. She was praying so hard one time that her husband, Elkanah, walked in, and he's like, 
good night. She's drunk. He thought she's drunk because of how she's just praying so much and so hard all the time. And I just always found this funny in 1 Samuel 1, 13 through 15. It says, Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. And then in verse 26 through 28, And she said, O oh, my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. So she chose to dedicate her child Samuel to the Lord. And of course he grows up to be a great man of God. And of course he grows up to be a prayer warrior like she was. And then we see in chapter 2 she gives God the glory. In 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 2 it says, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, that neither is there any rock like our God. So in chapter 2... It also discusses Eli's sons, who were priests, but they were wicked. They were called the sons of Belial. In 1 Samuel 2.12, it says, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. Not only this, but they were man horse, what Hebrews calls whoremongers, because in 1 Samuel 2.22, it says, Now Eli was very old, and heard all that his sons did into all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So they were so wicked that they were committing sexual sins with the women there. And chapter 3, it has this great verse in verse 1. It says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. So the word of the Lord should be precious to you. You have 24-7 access to the Word of God, but it should continue to be precious. Don't get to a point where you're just so used to having it that you just don't read it anymore. And the Lord talks to Samuel in this chapter. In verse 3, it says, And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, so this reminds us of something else. Don't let the lamp go out if you can help it. Don't let the lamp go out around you. Keep studying the Bible, teaching the Bible, and spreading the gospel. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, as the Bible says. But many people are letting the lamp go out. They're giving up on reading the Bible. They're giving up on teaching the Bible. They're giving up on spreading the gospel, and there's no light around them. 1 Samuel 3.21, And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So if you are a sincere, genuine Bible believer, and you're not letting the light go out, and the word of God is precious to you, then the Lord will reveal himself to you through his word, just like he does Samuel here. He reveals himself to Samuel in Shiloh. Now in chapter 4, Israel is smitten by the Philistines, who also take the ark of God. And when Eli hears about the ark being taken, he falls backwards and breaks his neck, because he was 98 years old and a very heavy man, the Bible says. And in chapter 5, since the Philistines took the ark of God, they are struck with emeralds, and that is hemorrhoids. As the Bible says, the way of a transgressor is hard and in this case it's a pain in the butt and in chapter 6 the Philistines are so tore up about the emeralds that they're going to send the ark of God back to Israel but not by itself they're going to send back images of their emeralds and images of the mice that marred the land so how nice of them but in chapter 7 Samuel as a circuit riding prophet went in circuit to Bethel 
in Gilgal and Mizpah, and they had what they would call a Holy Ghost revival meeting. And Israel was pricked in their heart to the point that they put away Baal and Asherah, their false gods. And that's a good sign that they had a revival. But in chapter 8, Samuel made his sons judges over Israel. Joel and Abiah, they turned aside after filthy lucre and took bribes and they perverted judgment. Many times the preacher's kids that become preachers don't turn out so good because they just don't have to go through all the toil and trouble when they start out like their father did. So these guys turned aside after filthy lucre, which, as Paul says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And you can see in chapters 8, 9, and 10 how Israel wants a king. Their choice is Samuel because of his, or excuse me, their choice is Saul because of his outward appearance. They wanted a human king instead of letting God be king. So in chapter 11, you have this strange character named Nahash the Ammonite. In 1 Samuel 11, 1 and 2, it says, Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes, and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. So this reminds me of the Antichrist who has a bad right eye and also likes to make covenants. In Zechariah eleven seventeen, it says, Woe to the idle shepherd, the Antichrist, that leaveth the flock. The idle shepherd, that's, that's the Antichrist, the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. So this is why you have the all-seeing eye symbolism today. Notice in chapter 13, Saul is offering an unlawful sacrifice. And notice that it's in chapter 13, the number of rebellion, and Saul is a rebellious king. As Samuel calls him in chapter 15, if you look at 1 Samuel 15, 22 through 23, <clears throat> he says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord... As great delight in burnt off offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So Samuel basically calls... Saul a rebel here and that's exactly what he is but back in chapter 13 notice Saul represents a modern day preacher or pastor who doesn't know which Bible is right and doesn't promote Bible reading to the people and he leaves his people without a sword in 1 Samuel 13 19 through 22 it says now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel for the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and with Jonathan his son was there found. So, you see Saul picturing a modern day pastor who doesn't equip his people with Bible knowledge, doesn't teach them, doesn't tell them which Bible's right, doesn't push Bible reading, doesn't push studying the Bible. That's what Saul represents here. And you need a blacksmith. It says there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. Be a blacksmith. Distribute the word of God. Preach the word of God. Publish the word of God. Promote it. Don't let your people go to battle without a sword. Get them to sharpen their swords. Get them to read the Bible, study it, memorize it. And Saul represents that modern day preacher who doesn't see the importance of the word of God when he has it available. 
but he loses God's spirit and gets an evil spirit. He starts out prophesying, but ends up without the word of God. And many modern day pastors started out on track and were turned aside after filthy lucre. He goes to the world and he goes to the devil. <clears throat> Compare this to contemporary megachurch pastors who use the world's way and devil's music to get a crowd, making them like Saul, who is the people's choice. The people's choice wants rid of God's choice, just like the average Christian today would rather listen to Rick Warren or Stephen Furtick than they would a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching pastor who talks rough and tells the truth. But Saul, the people's choice, wants rid of David, God's choice. In chapter 14, Saul does something else that's very ignorant. He commands all the people to fast, even though they need energy for the battle and for the journey. And Saul attempts to to be spiritual here, but actually just ends up being carnal. He says, anyone who eats will be put to death, but his own son ends up eating something. In 1 Samuel 14, 27 through 29, you see where it says that Jonathan ate something and his eyes were enlightened. And while we're on the subject of Jonathan... I want to show you how Jonathan pictures the Lord Jesus Christ in this book. As we've talked about many types of Jesus Christ before, but here's some similarities between Jonathan and the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, they're both the son of a king. Jonathan was the son of Saul, as you know, who was king. Uh, both Jonathan and Jesus make a covenant. David makes a covenant with Jonathan like we make a covenant with Jesus. Uh, Jonathan puts ro royal apparel on David, just like Jesus puts royal apparel on us, clothing us with righteousness. Uh, Jonathan's armor bearer follows him, just like we need to follow Jesus' steps. And look at this verse, these couple verses here, talking about Jonathan and his armor bearer in 1 Samuel 14. 13 through 14, it says, And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet, and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter which Jonathan his armor bearer made was about twenty men, within as it were a half acre of land, which a yoke of oxen might plow. So Jonathan did the fighting, and the armor bearer comes behind and finishes them off. Just like Jesus is the one who gets us through the battle. Jonathan intercedes for David just like Jesus does for us. We have one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So you'll see if you read 1 Samuel where Jonathan intercedes for David. And you'll see where Jonathan dies for the sins of others and made his grave with the wicked. And you'll see how Jonathan was a friend that sticks closer than a brother, just like Jesus Christ. As it says in 2 Samuel 1.26, I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. So he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And Jonathan also tells David what the Father says, just like Jesus would tell us what the Father says. John 15:15 15, 15 says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant, the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father have I made known unto you. So just like Jonathan told David what Saul would say, Jesus tells us what the Father says. So Jonathan is a great picture of Jesus Christ. But moving on to chapter 15, we see that Samuel, or Saul disobeyed the command of God. In 1 Samuel 15, 3, it says, Now go and smite Amalek, and utter, utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, in, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And then in verse 9, it says, But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep and of the oxen 
and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them but everything that was vile and refuse that they destroyed utterly so Saul spared the things that he thought was good this should remind you of your daily walk with the Lord maybe you have some things in your life that aren't bad but you know God wants you to get rid of them because they are stopping your fellowship with him just like Saul should have killed everything as the Lord had said and in chapter 16 we start getting into the life of David David is young and not a lot to look at but the Lord wants to be king so Samuel the Lord wants David to be king so Samuel anoints David David is a goodly godly young man who plays godly music on a harp and that music was able to make the evil spirits pass from King Saul. He would play on a harp. Saul would be troubled by an unclean spirit. And that music would make the unclean spirits pass away from Saul. And that goes to show you that there is a good kind of music that gets the devil away from you. And that there's a bad kind of music that just puts the devils on you. But as you know in chapter 17, that famous chapter... David goes on to fight Goliath and shoots a rock from a sling right to his forehead, jumps on top of him, and cuts his head off with his own sword. And then in chapter 21, you have one of the more funny stories in the Bible where David pr pretends to be crazy. And I just always love this story here in the Bible. In 1 Samuel 21, 12 through 15, it says, And David laid up these words in his heart, and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them, and feigned himself mad in their hands, and sc scrabbled on the doors of the gate, and let his spittle fall down on his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, you see, the man is mad. Wherefore then have you brought him to me? Have I need of mad men that ye have brought this fellow to play the mad man in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Maybe you could try this in your life. If you're afraid of someone bigger than you, then just act crazy, and maybe they'll be scared of you. But what always had me wondering is why David wasn't afraid of Goliath, but was afraid of this King Achish here. And sometimes in your Christian life, you are close to God and have boldness in the truth. Other times, you're scared. But having complete faith in God and in the truth will keep you bold at all times. And pretty much the rest of this book, what you'll see is Saul pursuing David. And on a couple occasions, David could have taken Saul's life, but he won't touch the Lord's anointed, as he says. Compare that with today. Every born-again believer is anointed, according to 2 Corinthians one twenty-one, which says, Now he which establisheth, establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us, is God. So you shouldn't mistreat or seek to hurt another believer. That is a dangerous thing. Don't go about to destroy another man's ministry because he's anointed. You don't want to be like Dave, be like, you want to be like David and not try to just hurt someone else. You don't want to hurt the Lord's anointed. As you probably know in this book, Saul loses the Spirit of God, loses all communication with God. So he visits the witch of Endor who brings up Samuel the prophet from the dead. But Saul was just a wicked man and a hypocrite, full of pride. As the Bible says in Proverbs 16:18, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And you know what happens at the end of this book? Saul falls on his own sword and commits suicide. Picturing that verse, because he falls on his sword. Pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. But this has just been something to whet your appetite for the Bible, for 1 Samuel. I don't want to give it all away, I hope you'll jump into the book of 1 Samuel and read and love the amazing stories of the Bible.